So it's all about the story. Now this is something that we say a lot in my household because as we, um, as Friday and I go about our day, we pay attention to people's stories. We pay attention to our own stories too. And it's always very interesting to us how important the story is. And I've spoken to this subject before, but um, I felt this was a very uh, crucial time to speak to it once again, and maybe in a more in-depth way. So I'm gonna talk about stories and about how we use them or misuse them. And um, Deborah is going to offer a treatment for how to get away from the stories, especially the ones that no longer serve us. I'm also being very conscious of how I'm moving today because I watched the video from last week and I was like a bobble doll. I was all around the place, just swaying to and fro, and I thought, oh my goodness, so I'm trying to stay in place. So stories, they do have a purpose. And uh, I, I love a good story. And uh, growing up, of course, I loved uh, nursery rhymes or the, uh, the children's tales, Grimm's fairy tales. And you know, Grimm's fairy tales had a purpose. They were um, horrible. Each one was a really horrible outcome. And it was to teach. It was a, a way of scaring children into good behavior. And um, there was actually a psychological element of that. And, um, but they, they also, in our own lives, give us a history. They help us really, you know, our stories kind of help define who we are and it shapes our identity. And it helps us make sense of the world. You know, you can tell where someone at is at generally by the story that is unfolding. Now stories are individual, and they have a life of their own. And if you've ever been with a good storyteller, someone who is telling you about an event in their life, if they've told you the story more than once, the odds are it grows in proportion and myth. And um, I, I had a friend who was really infamous for that. He would start with this really kind of innocuous story. And two years later, it was an epic. <laughs> and and as, as much as I laughed at that, I, I also had to look and go, well, what is in my life that I've transformed to sort of an innocuous story to epic proportion? And how often do we do that in our own lives? It's also always very interesting to me how, if you, especially in families, if you notice in families how siblings can go through the same experience but have two completely different stories, how it affects one sibling much differently than the other, other sibling. Um, I, as a hospice chaplain, I notice that frequently when uh, dealing with the families of patients and for some, the, the patient was the greatest person that had ever walked the earth, and for others, that they, they were very conflicted about the patient. And yet they had basically lived together. They all had lived together under the same roof, but they had different experiences of that. And so collectively, we have stories about our families and our friends and our communities and our, our church. This church has a lot of stories. <laughs> and, and some of them are, most of them are really wonderful, but some of them kind of makes your eyebrows go up like, are we talking about the same place? And, and many times the interpretations, they cause clashes. Can I have a new slide? But the, I think what it comes down to in stories is how attached are you to your story? And um, I know that story is very important as a healing aid, as a, as a 
in my friends in recovery, I have listened to their stories and they're quite powerful. And as they share their stories with others, it becomes quite powerful. It's a way of assisting another through this transition of addiction. So stories like that are, are, are extremely powerful. And sometimes we're so attached to our stories, we're like willing to die for them. Like this is the way it is. And um, we see that in our, in our country right now, that's part of the polarization of which story are you on board with? Um, how, how has the, the national story been uh, woven into the personal and individual stories? And stories are energetic. Um, they are what we consciously reinforce to our consciousness. And they're affirmations. This is something I, I got from um, Eric Butterworth. He was basically telling us that the stories that we, that we hold in our lives are, have an energy to them. And the words that we use to describe that story are the words and the affirmations that we are using in life. So if the story isn't a healthy story, if it isn't supporting you, you might want to consider changing that story because it really isn't serving you in the long run. The, th the thing that Eric really pointed out that, I, th that I, I got so clearly is how stories are temporal. They're a part of our temporary experience. They're really not about the essence of who we are. We are spiritual beings in this human life form. And as spiritual beings, our spirit is a direct reflection of God's love. That's the real story. Any time that we are looking at one another and that we are creating stories about that person, if we put aside the temporal experience and looked at each other spirit to spirit, we couldn't help but be completely in love with each other. Because that is the essence of our spirit, is love. Now I bring this up, I was at camp this past week, I think it was camping in the mountains. And um, my back feels it, I slept on the ground, my back is truly feeling it, and that's part of my story. And. Um, as I was camping with all these other people who I've been camping with for years, I was very cognizant of the stories that I had created about them. Because um, after 10, 12 years of knowing people and watching them go through processes in life, you think you have, or I thought I had a pretty good summation of what that person was all about. And I'm sure likewise, they for me. So I became very keenly aware of these stories that were coming up. And then I was remembering Eric, what, what Eric Butterworth said, that the stories are temporal. I'm looking at the temporal life of someone. I'm judging that temporal life. When in fact, they are a spiritual being. And my focus, the healthy focus, is on the love light that they shine. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.18, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So I wonder, how many times that we look at others truly at the eternal being that they are and that we put aside the story and uh, allow our love and their love 
to just mesh and envelop one another. It seems important. Life, the stories seem important at the time, but they aren't in the scope of eternity, in the scope of the spiritual life. And when we take away the story and we allow spirit to interpret, spirit, our spirit is made in God's image. So we are looking for love. Oftentimes we are looking for love on the outside of us and judging, you know, if the other person is a fit or they're not a fit. Let's look at, again, the spirit. I'm going to turn this over to you, my dear. And is there another slide? Yeah. This is her section, Words of Truth and Wisdom. Thank you. Good morning. I have some spiritual tools for you to remember the truth of who you are. And the first one is meditation. I have to tell you, I had the most wonderful experience here this week. I came Friday to clean the candelabras and the crucifix and the wax that was left on the altar and these tables. I came to be in service and I got a gift because the beautiful music here, the chanting that plays, I felt like wax on, wax off. I was working but I was in a flow, a beautiful flow and I was being filled up with the beauty of the silence and the quiet time with God. This place is so full of love and prayer. I highly recommend, please come to the World Day of Prayer to soak up and be filled up again with God's energy and love and light that is present in each one of you. God is within. So meditation for me, 10 minutes each morning, it's a practice, it's a commitment. Any athlete commits to practice daily to be the best. I choose to commit to practice daily my spiritual connection to God. And so in the silence, I'm not thinking about that person that's really driving me crazy or that problem. I'm choosing to go into the silence because that's where God speaks to me and reveals my next step. And it may not, the answer may not come in that 10 minutes. It may come when you're in the shower. Or it may come subtly. Sometimes it's just your body relaxes a little. That's God. God moving to you, through you, so your light shines the love and the light of God everywhere every day, in every way. Meditation is anchoring into the truth of your connection with God. You were birthed by God. You were given all the talents and abilities to succeed in your purpose and your passion. And God poured into this body form love and light, and he refills you every moment of every day. Our opportunity is to remember that God's always with us. It's just when we go into fear and doubt and worry that we feel separate from God. And that's when it's time to come back to meditate in that connection. And then another tool is prayer. Now prayer, there's not a God outside of you that you pray and beseech to, to please bring me that next job, or please help me get over this sore, broken leg. A prayer is anchoring in the, to, the, to the truth that there is only one power, one presence, and that is God. 
And if you go into the fear that this leg won't heal, you're believing in two powers, that it has more power than God. It doesn't. This is an opportunity for your personal growth, to grow in learning at a very deep level. There's only one power, and that's within you. God is within you. And to not give power to the wound. Be the observer. In prayer, you're in a high consciousness, and you observe your fears and doubts and worries. But because you're so anchored in the truth of your connection, you don't let that broken leg take you out and knock you over and have you bedridden for days. You observe it coming, and you're a grounded, rooted tree, and you just kind of watch, and you bend in the storm. You go, oh, I see a broken leg. Oh, that's going to heal. A few weeks, I'll be up and going again. You don't let it stop you. You don't give it power. God's the only power, and God is love and light. A third tool is affirmations. Affirmations are a divine statement of the truth. They can be long, they can be short, but they speak the truth. I am the love and the light of God. My next perfect job is right here, right now, and it's got abundant pay and the right connections, the right location. I've got benefits. It's the perfect hours. It's wonderful. My newest prayer, and at, rather affirmation, is divine order. Because I have to admit, the storms have been scaring me a little. And I don't want to give them power. I'm visual, and I know the power of speaking my words and listening to my story. So when I claim divine order, I see water, but it's calm and it's beautiful. And that means calmness in every area of my life. My finances are calm. My health is calm. My relationships are calm. I claim it. I anchor into that truth. Now I'm going to back up to prayer for a moment because I realized I didn't give you steps to use. In prayer, it's affirming there is one power and one presence, and I am one with it. I claim that connection. We're like an intertwined vine, and I am so grateful for that connection. I'm so grateful to know God's like my FedEx. I can count on FedEx to deliver, by golly, and FedEx does every day. Well, God's my FedEx. And God's in here. This is my central FedEx location. And every day, boxes go into FedEx, and they're rerouted, and they go out into the world. Well, this is my God FedEx station, and it's filled up every day with love, health, light, laughter, employment, perfect relationships. And then each day, I'm the present, I'm the package. I get to give out my love and my light, my gifts, to everyone every day. So prayer is affirming that gratitude for that FedEx consciousness. I am the love and the light. Thank you, God. Thank you for the perfect job. And release it. God's got this handled. He's at work. And he is powerful, and he can work in miraculous ways that I couldn't even think of. So your homework assignment for this week, if you so feel called, is to practice, commit to your connection to source, meditate, pray, say your affirmations, and know that you are the love and light of God, and these tools work. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Bubbly. I so appreciate that. That was beautiful. 
Um, I've got another slide. So what can I do? So Deborah gave you some wonderful um, action steps of meditation, prayer, and affirmation. And I say notice the story as it unfolds. Ask yourself, is this story really serving me? Does it really affirm who I am? And release your attachments to the story. Your story and other stories. Remember exactly what they are. We remember the truth that we are spiritual beings, that we are beings of light and love. And that is the real story. So this all kind of ties in because Wednesday and Thursday is World Day of Prayer. And we want to emphasize that we are here at, as a vehicle for you to release stories and uh, to bring it into prayer, to sit in meditation, to enjoy um, the joint consciousness that is meeting in this, this room, this space. And God bless you.